microphone. And I'd like to welcome everybody. This is, of course, the combined November and December special interest group for the CNC group on, in San Diego Fine Woodworkers Association. So the SDFWA CNC SIG. Um, and I think that gets us in the right place. It uh, is now 10 o'clock. We're going to go for about an hour or so. Uh, we'll have some discussion coming up. And I want to um, uh, tell you that the, the reason we were, uh, the reason I was thinking about this is because I recently did a project. I'm just going to briefly introduce it here and uh, tell me if you guys can see my, my monitor there. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. And so well, this is actually, a, uh, this is a shot I took with my phone of a, uh, during a movie we were watching. So we saw this, these display cases uh, in this movie and we, my wife and I kind of looked at each other. We both thought immediately that we needed one. And so I set about building this one and uh, I started out with a bunch of small scale drawings and fiddled around until I felt like I got the angles right and the number of tiers. This is actually seven tiers here, which is 56 inches tall. So I established the height of the overall object and I established the, uh, uh, the number of, of tiers and the depth and, and things like that. And then I went to drawing on a full size, uh, a full size drawing on a piece of large piece of cardboard and from there, then I was able to measure the angles and I was able to determine what I thought was the best angle, which turned out to be 58 degrees. They were all 58 degrees plus or minus on my drawing. And so I felt pretty good about that. Um, also, I wanted this to be able to be put away really easily. So each of these tiers, one, two, three, four, et cetera, each of these is glued up and is one unit. And then um, the next one just sits on top of it, but also the next one will nest inside of it so that when I store it, it will all be the height of this bottom tier, the dimensions of this bottom tier. So it won't take up much room in storage at all. And the way I wanted to do that was I wanted to create some very nice joinery. You see the mortise and tenon here that would allow it to um, snap together and hold. And of course I did, that kind of joinery also here where I glued them, glued each tier together. And since I was going to be um, gluing them together, uh, I, and I, but I wasn't going to be gluing this one, I knew that this might walk a little bit back and forth as during the, uh, while the glue was drying. And so I actually, these were, ex these more uh, mortises were executed after the glue was set in each tier and I stacked them one on top of the other and then I would draw with a pencil where that's going to be. Now what I did and let's see if I can stop sharing here and go back to this and are you seeing me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what I did was I made a little jig like this and um, Put a, I, I put this on the CNC table with uh, blue tape and CA glue, and I put a piece of wood across the top, and that allowed me to cut all of the end mortises just by sliding the piece in and clamping it. I didn't have to register each piece. I didn't have to uh, reset Z and, and, and uh, you know, reset zero and all uh, each piece. I just slap them in. I cut all of those mortises. And then once I drew the ones with a pencil, I took off this piece of wood that was here, and I would just slide the next piece in until the, the pencil lines for the mortise I'd drawn were visible in the, in the notch that was there. And then I would be able to cut that one. Um, and that wound up working pretty well. And I was able to chomp those out pretty quickly. Now, when I had to create the tenons, I decided to go back to, I, I had a couple of pieces of scrap and I made a little jig and I went back to the table saw and I would clamp a piece of wood on here uh, with a couple of spring clamps and then run it through the table saw and get the, uh, uh, you know, cut the, uh, the tenons out that way. But I got thinking that there's no reason why I couldn't have made something that angle with a piece here that would clamp in front of, on the front edge of the um, um, CNC machine. And then I would be able to uh, 
go ahead and do that joint on there too. So that was where I then got wondering about doing joinery. I knew that I had seen Perry Crutchfield uh, before when he was talking about uh, some joinery that he's executed. And so I thought I would invite him to come speak to us this morning and talk to us a little bit about some of the joinery that he's created on his um, CNC machine. And I know he's done some pretty spectacular stuff. So with that, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so this started, wow, a year and a half ago where I took the basic woodworking class and uh, went through the whole thing. And then on the very last class, my project got ruined. So I was kind of disheartened. I walked out of the door and I saw a CNC email from Travis about a class coming up. Uh, so I was interested in that, but there wasn't any coming up very, very quickly. So I asked him, could you, know, could you do a private class for me? I'll pay you for a private class because I want to do that. <clears throat> so he told me that if I T8 for him for three classes, that he would basically teach me the basics of how to do the CNC stuff. So that led to his knowledge of my interest in doing joinery. So he basically said after that, uh, go ahead and figure it out, you know, use the machines, make a test rig. So I made the test rig that you've seen or the, the, the end joiner thing that you've probably seen in the shop or, or uh, I don't know if it's there or not. I don't think it's there now, but it's there for a long time. <clears throat> but essentially how to mount the material on the front of the machine. Uh, so from that, I used to actually write tra training materials for Qualcomm. Uh, I wrote a couple things for the class and then I actually wrote a class on my own on how to do, you know, basic CNC stuff and also the joinery. So what I'm gonna to do today is go through and probably at a fairly rapid pace since we only have an hour, uh, what I've done for the class and then uh, hopefully it'll get, get your, pique your interest and you know, get things started here. So, All right, let's go back to here. Hang on one second. Wow. It's almost like this is gonna work. Okay. Uh, so you have seen, so here's, here is the, uh, the, the fixture that I created for this. And you can see a couple of different examples of different kinds of joinery, uh, simple dado, uh, mortise and tenon, which, you know, I've done this for, geez, a year now, a year and a half. And mortise and tenon is really bread and butter what I've done the most on this thing. And I'll show you why that is in a second and what, how beneficial that is. Uh, you can see the fancy one, which we'll talk about a little bit later on of the actual doing the letters of this. Uh, that took a while to do. And then, of course, dovetails. There's a couple different ideas on that. One of them using a utility called joint cam, which I thought was, you know, the, the total answer to all of this. And then I started using it for a while. And it's uh, not really intuitive and not super user friendly if you've ever tried to use it. Uh, the, the terms he uses are all off the wall. And doing a very, very simple mortise and tendon joint is not, uh, not simple at all. So I think we talked about all this. One of the things <clears throat> that is really, really important in all this is in whatever CAD program you use, whether it be Carbide Create, uh, Fusion 360, or probably for doing this, my favorite uh, V-Carve, you've really got to be able to know how to drive that tool pretty well to be able to do this successfully and with the least amount of pain. Uh, it, it's it's really, really driven by that whole, and this, this really drives that whole process and knowing how to create things and, you know, pretty complicated, you know, like in the case of the logo, you're saying pretty complicated things. So, uh, so Perry, can I ask you a question at this point? Sure. So I was looking for, um, you know, a jib like this. I was looking for some sort of, some sort of illustration on how to build one. And um, this is, this looks like a really good one, of course. Uh, but I was also wondering, why couldn't you just attach a chain-driven dovetail vise to the front of the, of the table? Can you see uh, So look at my alter ego here. Um, actually, I, we can't see that camera because we're looking at the, your screen. No, this is a separate user. I actually have two users and two, two users in here. So you can actually select Perry Crutchfield number two. And you'll see my, uh, it was the one that was had the revolving uh, thing before. Yeah, I can see it really small down here on the um, participants. Yeah, yeah, double click on double click on it. 
Yeah, it's not not showing me. Okay. Don't worry about it. Just can you go ahead. So essentially, this is my. Uh, okay, now my... I got it up for everybody. I think. Huh? Say I again. I've got it up for everybody now. Okay. So my first my first comment on the fixture you're looking at is don't do it that way. Okay. Because it's way way it's way 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 more complicated than you really need. Uh, I kind of went went crazy on the first design, and then I came back and said, okay, all I really need, so everybody can kind of see this now, you can see basically that I have a rail, and if I want to do a longer piece of material, I have two rails, so I have another one down here on the bottom. And all I do is I'll take my piece and put it between the two uh, T-track sections. Hopefully everybody can see that. And then I'll clamp it down with, with uh, one of the clamps. And you can see I have all the access I need to the top part of this. Right. And that's as simple as it really needs to be. Basically a rail with a T-track section here. And, you know, that does the job for everything I've needed to do. So okay. And where did you get that rail? Uh, this is actually an Avid CNC. So it comes to basically it comes okay. as the front part of the, of the whole CNC. But, you know, you, you could basically just make a fixture with just two T-tracks on it. Yeah. And then kind of do this. And then this rail on the right, it slides back and forth to capture whatever material that I'm trying to do and keep, basically keep it square. This rail is obviously squared with the front of the table. So then I know I, I know I have basically I know I'm squared and I know that the top of my material is square. If not, mm -hmm. I can always just surface it too, you know, if I want to do that. Uh, but the other magic is that your bit has to come two inches in front of this this flat section here to be able to do this. Right. So is that is that a, a long answer to your short question? Uh, it's a good good answer. Thank you. Yeah. So don't don't well, basically don't do what you're seeing. <laughs> I guess that's my that's my that's my moral to that story. So don't do what you're seeing here. You know, but you learn, right? You learn how to make things simpler and you know how to do it right in a second. But the main thing is to be able to and everybody, I'm back on my presentation now. The main thing is to be able to have access to this surface right here and not freak out because you're doing something uh, that's mounted vertically instead of horizontally. It's the same exact thing as if you were doing it on a table. You set your zero, zero, you, you basically go to your carve and then you run it. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that on the next few slides. So, <laughs> all right, uh, manual versus joint cam. I talked about that a little bit. <clears throat> I never use joint cam anymore. Yeah, this is another thing that I went for the extremely complex version. I got it to work and I made some really cool looking stuff with it, but you know what? I can do it a lot faster just by going in there. And I think I learn a lot more and know more about how the machine works and how to do the designs by doing them myself in VCarve, which for you might be joint cam or I mean joint cam, for you might be Fusion 360 or a Carbide Create. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the manual process. I think you could actually, you could do it in SketchUp too, if you know how to translate DXF files between tools. So you can even do it in SketchUp if, if anybody's taken that class and likes it. DXF is a way to generate tool or generate uh, uh, vector files and a good way to get between different CAD systems if you haven't done that before. Uh, it's a good thing to know. Uh, simulate, always simulate before you run something in uh, Carbide or wherever, whatever, whatever CNC controller program you're looking at. Uh, actually in the, the, car, the CAD program. Uh, mount the material. <laughs> Joint cam process, I'm not going to talk about that. One of the really important things and how I got screwed up, let's just talk about, well, first of all, we're just going to talk about mortise and tenon. That, that's probably one of the, the, like I said, the bread and butter. Let me see if I can go to something that just impressed the heck out of me. So I basically have been turning my home into a shop. And part of that process has been taking my garage and making a bunch of tools on, on roller sleds. So you can see this is my dust collector. And if you'll notice, it's about who, maybe five feet tall, maybe not quite that much. But look at what I have, how I have it supported. Basically four, not even a two, but basically four two by twos. So can you imagine then this is probably a 50 pound, maybe 60 pound weight on top of that. So that doesn't sound very solid, does it? So it, just shake your head no, because it, when I did it, I actually had the idea of putting plywood panels on the side and the back to make it so it didn't wave back and forth. <laughs> so I took four of these guys. I made a mortise and tendon joint of, geez, it only stuck out like a maybe a quarter of an inch 
the tan above the, the, the flat surface of the, the shoulder. Did four of these guys, glued it up, and you know, it's completely, you can't even rock it like an inch. It, it, it was absolutely completely solid. So that's how, how powerful, and you experience woodworkers already know this, but for me, it was really a shock at how, how stable this thing was. So that's why I kind of started with mortise and tenon for all of the tables and everything else that I built. Uh, joint size, normally when I'm doing mortise and tenons, <clears throat> I will grow between the two. I started out with five, but that was kind of tight, especially for glue. So I'm actually doing eight thousandths per side right now, and it's a little bit loose, but you know, with the glue, it seems to work out quite well. Uh, pocket. So let's talk more about. Okay, let's start with just a simple dado, which is actually what you did. Uh, what I'll do for this is just create a pocket, and then this is this is boring. So this is basically just kind of what you've already been doing on the top side of the table. So I'm not going to dwell on this very much. The one that's interesting. Let's keep going a little bit. Here we go. Let me turn off. Remove this. So the mortise and tenon. The tenon or the mortise is actually kind of the same thing you've already been doing. Basically, you lay that flat on the table, but the mortise is the interesting one. So I did the first one I did was actually with two by fours. And the most important thing, which is where I got screwed up at first, is assuming the thickness of the material. So when I did a tenon, uh, I just assumed it was an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And then I cut the mortise the same way. But unfortunately, they're never exactly that size unless you go ahead and you know do a uh, mill them to be that size. So my mortise and tenons were always off by a little bit. So in other words, I'd have a little bit of overlap on one side and a little bit of a gap on the other side. So it was driving me crazy. So what I really started doing now is every time I do this, I'll put the exact, even down to like the ten, the thousands of uh, the length and the width of the material. So once I know that, I'll go into the carve. I'll set the height and the width as I just talked about. Uh, thickness I don't really care about because it's basically only going to cut the top of it. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to go into V-carve, <laughs> add the layers, okay. So what I'll do there is I'll draw two rectangles. <clears throat> since this is going to, since it's a 10 end, it's going to be a pocket operation. So you see the middle one. <clears throat> basically that's going to be where the, where the 10 end sticks out. So why do I have uh, square cor round corners on this? Anybody? Blue. And well, it's going to be easier to cut round uh, inside corners on your mortise. Yeah, you can't do square corners. That's the only problem. And, and Travis rightfully said, <laughs> I can use a 16th, uh, I can use a 16th bit. Uh, and I actually have a 16th uh, end mill that will do only 625 or basically 5 eighths of an inch depth. So if that mortise was uh, uh, only five eighths of an inch sticking out, then I could actually do a 16th inch, which is pretty close to square. Uh, but really, if, if I'm doing mortise and tenon and I have control over both, which I do, I'll just use a, a more, more rounded type of, of tenon on the corner. So. Now, interestingly, I've actually read articles because when you use a router to cut the mortise, you always have that problem. And I've read articles from woodworkers who claim that in their testing, um, the rounded corners actually make for a more stable joint. I believe that because all the stress is not just on one point. It's basically, right. it's basically spread out around that whole curve. So that makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, this is really simple. This is basically, if you can go and do two squares in V-carve or whatever program you use, you can do this. Uh, the outside one is square. Uh, I always make the outside rectangle bigger than the material because why? Well, I, I know that I ran into problems when I was um, on something I was doing recently where I was trying to flatten a piece of material. You don't want to leave a little edge because you've, sure. you're, you're setting your zero was off by a thousandth or something. Very good. Yeah, because you leave that little, that little bit of pain in the butt when you have to sand it. It's easy to sand off, but why not just make it bigger and get rid of it in the first place? So very simple operation, two squares, uh, set the depth, measure the material. So you can see right here, I have the width and the height of what I'm trying to do. Uh, this actually is not correct in this, in this diagram. When I mount this on the table, <clears throat> I'm gonna make, so this, if this, assuming this surface is along here, everybody can see my cursor, I hope. When this surface here is mounted flat against the table, <clears throat> 
This point right here is going to be one option for my zero zero. Uh, I've kind of waffled back and forth on where to make my zero zero. Uh, I started off with this always being the zero zero, but now sometimes I'll actually make the center the zero zero. Uh, I have a I, I actually write scripts for my CAD pro, for my uh, CNC controller. So what I did was I wrote a script that I put in the width of the material and the height of it, and then it actually moves my zero zero point to the center. And that seemed to make it better as far as centering what I'm trying to do in, in here and getting rid of that problem that I said where if this edge or if this tenon is a little bit too far to the right, up, up, down, left or right, then you're gonna have a little bit of a lip here which you don't wanna do. So uh, over time by measuring and by doing this, I've gotten it down to where they meet up really, really well. I mean, you can always sand it down, but it's better not to have that problem in the first place. Uh, pocket tool path, <clears throat> cut, di cut depth is height of the tenon. Normally I will make it, you know, 30 second. I mean, you, you can, you can, I'll, I'll let your guys be the judge too, is if you're making a tenon, how much deeper do you make it? So you have like a glue pocket down there. Uh, uh, 30 second of an inch is what I've been adding and it seems to work out well. So any other comments on what's, what's a good uh, extra depth between your mortise depth and your tenon? By the way, if any of you who are muted want to speak, if you hold down your yeah. space bar, you can speak and, yeah. and, and it won't be a problem. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, tool diameter doesn't matter. I, it it kind of depends on what I want to make that curve. So I usually use just, you know, a 25 inch or a quarter inch end mill is kind of like my go-to. Uh, I have an eighth of an inch. What I did was I got some extra long bits, probably maybe an inch and a half cutting height, so I can essentially do any that I want to do or as deep as I want to do them. <clears throat> Even though a lot of times it's not very deep. Uh, I use my feed and speed. Uh, there's some dispute amongst some of the staff at the shop on uh, using a tool called G-Wizard. Uh, I use it a lot. I actually bought it and then let it run out and it still fits free after that. You know, I've had it, I've used it for a year and a half and putting the, the parameters in there it really seems to do a good job. And you have anybody not know not know what G Wizard is? <clears throat> Never heard of it. I don't know. It's basically a feed and speed calculator. So let's. let's I don't have you know we don't have enough time to really get into that in depth. But Google uh, G Wizard. We we'll actually to ask Travis about it because he knows about it and we've talked a lot and he's he's a very uh, very up to date on that tool. So really really good, especially when you're trying to do this the first time. It's like you know what in feed and speed, what material, what depth, you know. So G Wizard. Or email me after this, or you know, contact me. I'm not again, I actually have a whole section on that, but I don't. Uh, maybe, maybe on a future talk, I can talk about that a little bit. It works. Okay. Uh, okay, we talked about everything here. In mill twenty-five thousandths tool diameter, cutting parameters, uh, eighth of an inch per per pass, which are all. And even though I have the you know the beefy machine. <clears throat> A lot of the settings that I use are still what I used to use on little good old shape oko, you know, because it works. And I, you know, I'm not in a hurry. I just want it clean. So I will still use, you know, really, really uh, conservative passes of depth. <clears throat> so like half the width of the bit and then spindle speed. And then I, uh, I'll go to like 75 for my speed rate. I know Travis wants you to use a little slower on the shape oko. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's something to but you, know, you got to go what works for you. Uh, but I don't go, you know, I could go 200 if I wanted to, but I won't do that. Usually I'll still stay within, you know, less than 100 for my speed, for my uh, feed rate. Harry? Sorry, go ahead. Did you say, this is Dick Gregory, did you say that you um, used to do this on a shaper tool? Shapo, shapoko. Oh, Shapeoko, okay. Yeah, he I'm did not familiar with a lot shop. of the CNC. He, he did ahead. this at the shop on the Shapeoko. Yeah. Okay, all right. How much of this type of work can you do on the Shaper tool? Uh, or are you familiar with that? Everything you've seen. Everything you've okay. seen so far you can, but you need a fixture to be able to mount it properly. So I think okay. what they had is they had a their flat thing with all of the uh, guidance stripey things. And yeah, they, they have a table now too. Yeah, in the middle of that, they had a, a, a hole. I guess you could uh -huh. do on the edge. 
And essentially you're doing the same thing. You're just basically bringing up what you're going to cut through the hole and then you can still move the, move the, I almost bought one of those before I was doing this. So yeah, I, I know a lot about it. It's really a cool tool. And Travis actually sent me a, <clears throat> I'm doing a French cleat wall <clears throat> for my shop. And Travis sent me a bunch of designs on how to do different uh, cubbies and things like that for that. So. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no worries, man. That's, that's what I'm here for, man. Uh, cut depth, we talked about that. <clears throat> And then, so, you know, it's kind of just the opposite, except I'm just doing basically a pocket in, into this. So, oh, Morris, I'm sorry. Uh, this is pretty obvious. I mean, I think you've done this before. Uh, if you want to do it on, it kind of depends if how you want to mount these things. If you want to mount it like, so if I want to mount my mortise like this, and tenon. Uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. I don't have a picture of the other one I'm talking about. So in other words, if I if, if there was another two by four going out here in this direction, kind of like I was if I was building a frame, then I might do this tenon a little bit differently, versus if it was basically joining two two by fours in Dan, which I've also done. So, but I guess really the same thing is one of these you could do on the table, flat, horizontal. But if I was trying to join two, let's say I take live one of these and I wanted to make a longer two by four, uh, then I would have to do this piece mounted vertically on the front of the table as well. Does that make, that make sense And all my yeah. babbling? Yes. Okay, good. But in both cases, you would essentially just draw a your pocket essentially, which is going to be uh, the tenon plus whatever. Actually, people know carb could people know carb I create? Is there a way to do a take a shape and then copy it, adding a tolerance a gap around the edge of the shape? Well, there's a way to draw a an, a shape another shape offset a certain tolerance okay. that would be effectively the same thing. Yeah, so this is what I'm talking about right here. So I'll take the tenon, and then I will enlarge that by, like I said, I said five thousandths here, and I've I've, mod I've uh, morphed over to eight thousandth. But in V carve, in V carve, it is a this function right here, offset yeah. vector. Yes. Yeah. There's a similar would, function. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, that's how you create your mortise versus your tenon. Very, very simple. And then, since I'm type A, I always want to go and look every time. Every time I do something in this, because I hate really hate having to redo it, <clears throat> I'll go and look at what I've created and what I think it should have accomplished. And since it's so easy to measure, I'll go and measure that I really did get, get, did get five thousands. So. You know, that, that's my number one thing about using CNC is you know double check, triple check everything. You know once once you, once I've rammed a uh, five thousand bit or a, a quarter inch bit into my table, and that that grinding sound it makes you you really don't want to do that again. So mm -hmm. I've done it a couple times. Uh, okay, we've talked about this. We've talked about how the, with the glue height added, cut depth plus a sixteenth for glue. Uh, People that use VCarve, you may or may not know that you can actually type a equation when you're typing in a dimension. So for this, I can go 75,000 plus, plus 0.01, and it actually works. Uh, you might have to hit the equals key to make that work. Okay. So here, here's an example of, of how we would do this. So I would mount this piece on the vertically on, on the fixture. My zero, zero would be upper left as I'm facing the front of the fixture. <clears throat> oh, here's the, here's the example I was looking for here. Uh, and if I was doing a frame, then I could actually put this piece horizontally on the table and this one vertically and it would match just fine. What I normally do is I'll cut the tenon first uh, and then fix down with blue tape, the famous blue tape, the mortise and then do my first pass at the mortise and see what it feels like. And I'll, I'll leave it on the table, the horizontal piece. 
do a fit check and try to make sure it fits right. Uh, that way I don't have to try to re, uh, re zero everything out if, if, if it doesn't fit. And I've had cases where I wanted to make it a little bit bigger. You can't make it smaller, but you can make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so actually I gave you the answer to this question. So if I wanted a joint like you're seeing down here in the lower left, I've already said basically you'd have to mount both pieces on this. And I, when, I've, when I've run out of materials and I needed a longer two by two by two or two by four, I've actually done this. And I'll tell you what, it's, been, it's as strong as if I would have had the original wood, especially with the kind of glue we have these days. Uh, this. Okay, good. Uh, now, enough of the boring, boring mortise and tennis stuff. This is, this is the good stuff. This is where you really have to know how to do whatever, how, how to use your tool that you're using. <clears throat> so in this case, I'm actually making a star pattern. So what I did was I found a graphic on the web of this star right here. <clears throat> And what I wanted to create was this. You're thinking, oh my goodness, that's crazy. That's so complicated. You'll never get used to doing it. But you know what? If you know the CAD program well, it's actually very simple to do. The limiting factor in all of these shapes that you use is what diameter bit. <clears throat> so you've seen I've taken a star that you see in the picture below. And I've kind of made it a lot more blobby, more roundy star. So to make that, all I did was I, I, I drew one version of it in VCarve. I took the diameter of the bit that I wanted to use, which in this case, I think I used an eighth of an inch. Uh, and I made a bunch of circles. And what I did was I took those circles and I placed them at key points all around the edge of the star. So now I know that when I'm cutting this, my bit will fit in all of these different places. Everybody, everybody clear on that so far? Because that's it's really important to get to get you started. Yes. Okay. Uh, now I could have gone to a sixteenth of an inch bit too, uh, although I could have only remember if I do that I can only do a uh, five eighths of an inch depth on my tenons on my tenons. So I would take one of these, I would put them whatever, all around the shape that I want to do to make sure that I can uh, do it. And let me see, let me show you, here's where I'm really gonna see if I can get creative here, or how prepared I am. Not you. There we go. So if you see, I did the same thing on the logo here, and I had to take a dot, a dot. Let's see if I have these. That was my that was my reference. So what I did was I t essentially took a logo off the web, I traced it, and I put bits, circles, in all of the different places. Like I would put one in the S up here, I would put it uh, down in this section here, I would put another one here. So let's actually do an example of this. So if I wanted to use an eighth of an inch bit, and I, let's put one. So you can see, as you close that, so you can see I couldn't actually do this with an eighth of an inch bit. So I had to actually go through a sixteenth of an inch. Actually, I think I did do with an eighth, but I don't know what, how I did it. But anyway, so you can see how you can really, really tell ahead of time what you can create and what, what re what's realistic when you do these things just by basically taking a bunch of circles and, and kind of moving them around. Okay, so once you do that, <clears throat> the towel that I want to use. So this is essentially, essentially the end piece of that material. I will divide that up into sections on how far do I want to spread out these stars. Uh, here's my width. I'll then, and this is kind of the back backwards way of thinking about it. I'll take the star, I'll create the image like you saw in the first slide. Make dots. And one of the easy ways to create these things, and this, this is where I talk about getting more into the advanced CAD stuff, is I'll put bubbles. Maybe I might use an eighth inch. I'll probably bump that up just a little bit, maybe, you know, like one, you know, 130 or even 150 on the size of these bubbles. 
And then what I'll do is I'll just connect them. Hopefully you'll see that on the next one. I'll go and I'll draw connections from here to here. And this is one of the reasons that I really like VCARV is it really is, it does a good job of telling you where the actual uh, tangency point on these circles are. So I'll draw this from here to here, I'll connect these. And then essentially I'll go all the way around this whole diagram. I'll connect the edges of all these bubbles and I'll do a star that I know for sure that I can actually create in on the CNC. I'm not gonna go into the details on how to do that because you're gonna wanna basically whatever CAD system you use. <clears throat> and if you don't know how to do that in VCARV, you know, I can, uh, I can help you to whatever extent you know, I can over the web. But you know, Google, man, is it's amazing on how, how good it is when you try to, if you just have to figure out the right search string on how to do this. But, uh, so then I've trimmed it. So, and essentially when I trimmed it and I get rid of the bubbles, then I end up with this, which is one of my stars. Uh, and I use the scissors in VCARV to get rid of the extra bubble parts, which really works well. And then I will copy paste. Remember we went to, or I started with this before, where these intersections, these guidelines are, is where I'm gonna put the center of each star. So essentially then I have my tenon pieces here, which is gonna look like this. I will make those a little bit bigger with the uh, uh, adding the adding the size to this. I can never remember the name of that feature for some reason. Anyway, and I make my mortise. <laughs> oh, that's, that's another one. That's the term. Okay, I'm, I'm so offset. Yes, thank you. And then essentially, I'll go and cut it. Just this, it's, it's just as if I was cutting a mortise container, just an old boring one, except it's more more complicated. Uh, and it, it's, I, it's simple to me because I've done it a lot, but it's not really, once you know the CAD part of it, and once you practice and you know about the bubbles and the restrictions of how to get a bit in there, really pretty simple. It's a lot more, you know, a lot less intimidating than when I first looked at it, and hopefully uh, than when you're first looking at it. So another example, which is kind of cool, is to take these bubbles and make a wave pattern connect them the way we saw before. You make basically a, a gummy bear or a, a worm. Clean up the little goofy edges that seem to pop up now and then. And how about this for a joint? Okay, so you can do a wave. And basically, as, once, you get, once you get this down, sky's the limit on what you can do as long as you can fit your bit in whatever pattern you're trying to create. So is wavy gravy a, an engineering term, Perry? Ah, yeah, it is. <laughs> well, I heard that, but it works. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you want to impress somebody with a, with some fancy journey, man, this this I actually like this one. I actually might have to create this one it's pretty soon, but it's pretty cool. So Perry, uh, this is Rob. Quick question. Are you going to get to the zeroing on the machine? It's probably different, but, but where I see the challenge being is once you got the software down, which you're helping us understand, yeah. Getting that zero at the exact location so you don't end up with those little lips. How do you ah. zero is gonna be a challenge yeah, you, two different actors? Let me see. I uh here we go. Oh, I thought everything here. Uh dovetail, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Fixed version. Well, the answer is uh, to talk Travis into getting the laser that I have extra <laughs> sitting in my desk. <laughs> that is the most complicated part of this. You know, I, I tried eyeballing it. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm gonna keep working on the spoons and stuff. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, laser really is the right way to go. And I, I don't know if you could mount one on yours or not, but if not, you kind of just got eyeball because the, the actual fixture, the zeroing cube, aluminum cube does not work for this. Ah. So you, you, you really just got to eyeball it, you know, until you can get a better way to do it. Uh, another thing is if you, you know, if you use the fixture that's in the shop <clears throat> and you mount it the same way, basically if it stays mounted there, 
then you know that this point right here, if you, if you, if you slide a board up, up, up against this fence and you level it with the top of this, which is why it was designed to be that way. So essentially you could take a flat edge. Everybody can see what, oh, here we go. I actually showed it. Take a flat edge, put it from here to here, and actually here too, if you're doing two, uh, you know where X, Y, Z is. And if you write those coordinates down, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a way, I know I can do it, but I'm pretty sure I used to do this in uh, carbide motion too, where you're setting the zero, zero, zero of your material. So once you know that point, in other words, if this fixture is mounted permanently, this ain't gonna change, even though I don't really trust it myself when I always redo it. But still, in theory, this point will never ever change. So that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way is, man, you just gotta eyeball it, or like I said, I have lasers that I'll give to Travis. You know, if, if he wants to take, you know, take the time, or somebody wants to make a fixture hanging off the Shape Oco in, in the shop, you know, I'll donate the, the lasers. They're not that expensive, but I actually have a couple that I didn't end up using. Man, I'll tell you what though, once you get that down, you know, Howard, uh, every, everybody knows Howard, right? If not, he, yeah. he's actually he showed me how to do this, where it's, it's incredible. It's, it's really, really, really accurate. So why couldn't you use a metal uh, piece of material and do contact on this, you know, zero, you know, the, the automatic, the zero, the probes. Yeah. Why couldn't you just use an edge, you know, a metal piece of stock and do it with a, a probe and do side contact and get that point. I've actually done that. Uh, it's, It'd be better than eyeballing. Actually, what I did was I took a piece of aluminum foil, and you have to really be, be careful about you know making sure that. Uh, well, actually, you know, if you, yeah, if you, you can get some, you can get you can get some one inch square aluminum tubing from Home Depot for like three bucks. Or you know what you can get. Uh, what do they call them? Basically, there's a gate. It's a gauge made out of brass that is exactly, you know, exactly an eighth of an inch. Uh, so you could take a gauge like that and do the math and get it that way. And that, that's not a bad idea. And then essentially just move it over a thousandth, or a thousandth of an inch at a time until the bit makes contact. Uh, yeah, you could do that. I mean, I used to do that too, but then I got the laser and I don't have to worry about it anymore. But, but that's, that's actually a very, very good point. But you just need something that you know the exact width of. And what you do, you know, it makes it easy. Uh, let's see, what else? That really is the gist of what it is. It's, it's a lot simpler than at first. So who's going to go try this? So I'm going to be trying it eventually. I don't have a project in mind immediately, but I, I would like to ask you about the, um, uh, the dovetails, because what you're doing yeah. so far, you can draw pretty easily in a CAD program. How do you draw the... Uh, how do you draw it when you're going to be cutting dovetails? I'm so glad. Yeah, that's good. I, I totally forgot about that. Okay. It's actually very simple to do dovetails as well as anything else. Uh, let me see if I found something that's like that. With a dovetail, you have a dovetail bit. I don't have anything. Well, hang on. Let me, let me see if I put You have a slide. You've gone past it a couple of times. There, yeah, you got some in here with dovetails. This is in VCAR. That's a joint cam. Joint cam. All you do with a dovetail is you take the drawing that I said before, you make the vertical lines at the center of where you want each cut to be. You then run a quarter inch or whatever the width between these two corners are. Everybody hopefully can see my cursor. So you figure out what that width is there. And so let's say it's just make my life easy and say it's a quarter inch or whatever. And you run a first pass with an end mill, quarter inch, to clear out down to this level. So basically make the, the dovetail bits job easier is all you're doing. Right. So you're just gonna cut a, almost like a box joint first. And then on the same center line that, the same center line that you use to do this guy, then you run the dovetail on the same exact path to cut out the dovetail. So in your CAD program to create the DXF, you're essentially just creating a bunch of lines. Yep. 
That's right. And then you're it's saving cool. one as a tool path for your clearing bit and saving one as a tool path for your dovetail, or you just use the same thing, just different bits. Actually, I think what I did one time just to be, just to try to be clever is I made a box. Actually, I made a series of boxes where the edge of the box, or I should say square, not box. I made a bunch of squares and the center of the square was where the two dovetail, the center of the two dovetails would be. And that way when the bit, I don't know one of these, that way when the bit ran, it would essentially go around the, and do a profile cut. And it would essentially cut all the way around the, the box with the end mill. Everybody see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So think about this from the end. So basically look at the thing about it from here, I would basically go down, over, through the center right here which cleans out the area for the dovetail bit. And then that, and then you could essentially, you could really almost use the same path as long as you made the clearances outside the face of the material big enough uh, to clear the, the dovetail bit. And then essentially you could basically do it. So this would be one, two, three, this would be four boxes essentially, or four squares to do this. So do your four squares. Uh, run your end mill through here for the first pass and then run your dovetail for the second. And you know, it, it, it may sound complicated talking about it, but it's, it's not really. Now, where is that gonna be a problem, anybody? Where will, where will that need some extra uh, work to make it work? And what type of, de <clears throat> what, what, would, what would be the characteristic of the dovetails that would make you have to do extra work in that scenario? Well, depending on the depth that you're running the dovetail bit to, it would have to kind of match where your end mill has traced for the clearing path. You mean the, the depth, thinking about it, looking at it from this direction, you're talking about the depth of the width between the dovetails. Well, okay, so it's a, it's a, there's a combination. So you've got, you know, if you're going, let's say you're going three quarters of an inch deep with your dovetail bit. Uh, so three quarters inch up from the bottom of the dovetail, there's a certain diameter, and that's got to be the same as what you clear with your clearing bit. True. So, well, so let's say, actually give me an example. The problem would be the example the of, let's say, okay, let's say this was a half of an inch between these two. That means that in theory, I could use a half inch end mill. Let's, let's make it more, 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 more weird. Uh, let's say it's three quarters of an inch between these two right here. So if I, if I was going to run through the center with a quarter inch end mill, uh, I could do the full depth of this. One pass wouldn't do it. So I could, I would have to make more than one line or I would have to make my squares in such a way that I would basically clear this entire distance between these two edges. Now, did that address your question or is it something else? Yeah, I'm not sure since I haven't done this. I was taking a stab at your question, which is what what would the problem be? What problem are you going to run into? What I just said, basically, if this if this if this dimension is wide enough that you couldn't clear it out with one pass of an end mill. Ah, yeah. You just do multiple passes, basically. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. Uh, you could actually make a square for each clearance area. Right. You see what I'm saying? You, could, that, that, you know, I think that's probably the way I would do it <laughs> is I would make a square for each one of these and then I would be essentially, all of, all of your CAD systems have a step and repeat. So what I do is I'd make one of these the right clearance, so the right square, <clears throat> and then I would just step and repeat all the way along this whole thing. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And then I would do a center line for the dovetail pass. I have to try that. That's actually, that actually would work. The magic of this whole question, thing. If I may, sure. when you are running your bit through the wood, do you get, well, let's call it breakout as it's coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, very good. Uh, yes. So what I'll do with that, oh, let me, there's a couple of different ways to address that. What one he did. Video I, one video I watched basically had the router bit come in part way from one side and then go around and come in the rest of the way from the other side. 
Uh, you could do that. That makes it a little more complicated, but so what? I mean, basically, if you're doing squares, you would essentially just make two squares. So in other words, you would make, instead of one big rectangle coming through these guys, you would make two rectangles that met in the center. Overlap a little bit. Overlap, Overlap a little bit. That's, that's a good, that's, a, that's actually would work. The other thing that he does, joint, the joint cam guy does, which I don't like because it was score, he basically he would score. Everybody can see the edge that I'm talking about. He essentially with the dovetail bit would score like a really, 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 really fine depth, maybe like 10 thousandths. As if you were to taking a scribe and going along this edge. Uh, so, he, so he would scribe this whole edge with a first pass before he cut these channels. Uh, but I actually like your idea about, you know, basically coming in from both sides, because that's guaranteed not going to be a problem. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, could, could you possibly use tape across it? Like uh, when I cut melamine and I put tape, uh, yeah. can, can you put tape or is that going to gum everything up? Uh, you know what? I've, I've used tape that same way successfully. So, you know, this, this is, uh, this is try it, you know, this is try different things and, you know, whichever one of them works for you, you'd use it because, you know, there's many different ways to solve this problem. Uh, tape, I have had success with that before. It's not going to gum up the, the bit or anything like that or? No, no, no. You, you just clean it off afterwards. Okay. I don't Thank think you. that would be a problem. No. A Perry, what are, are all those, you know, uh, rounded corners you've got showing square corners here yes. in all the joints are they all slightly rounded to your eighth inch or sixteenth inch no that's the beautiful part about doing vertical mounting is on these guys I can get square because I'm going through it in this fashion okay so Perry you it's have the to... bit shape that's getting it square Look at yeah. the bit the bit he's using, so yeah. that's what's making it square and giving you those corners. Terry, the pin the pin side, that's the part that's throwing me off. You know, the, the tailboard you can you actually come straight through the pin side, you have those angles. So how do you build that in? You'd have to you'd have to do that vertically too. It's just showing it horizontally, but you'd have to do that vertically too. Actually, no, wait a minute, no. No, I lied to you, damn it. Uh, you would turn it upside down and you would be able to cut those. The, the pin board outside face, yeah, you'd have to turn that, you'd have to do that upside down. Let me see, you know, I have actually, have, let me show you something else that uh, may answer your question better than my babbling. Hang on one second. It looks like you could do it upside down, but it also looks like you could do it on the edge with a straight bit. You, know, you would just have to design your, or both. your design the instead of a square, you design that trapezoid. Cut your own. Oh, there's it. But I like that. Once just a little bit of two dimensional CAD stuff, and with that tool, and on the end of your uh, machine, you can do some really yeah. cool stuff. Oh man, you know it's it's once you realize once you once you once you connect the dots, man. So here here's here's an example of, of what you're talking about. Everybody can see. So the cool thing is, you know, this is going to match up because you cut them at the same time. <laughs> what you do here is you'll do you'll still do the first pass. Hopefully everybody can let me let me zoom in on this. Here we go. Now was this done using joint cam? Yes. but I could do the same thing manually, very easy. So you see here that the piece on top is pretty much, I think that's pretty much exactly what I just, what you just looked at. So I would cut the dovetail here, going back, and it would essentially cut it. Well, yeah, it, it is turning upside down like we talked about then. So mm -hmm. I would run the dovetail about all the way back up to here. And then I would get, if I'm being clever, yes. this will work. Yes, so here the clearing pass has been run. Yes. And now you're ready for the final cut. And that's awesome. You just shift your board and two okay. at once. And that's what it looks like. I can't, I can't even tell you how cool it was. When that came off, I just, I was so stoked. It was just like, wow. 
Oh, yeah, and this was a joint cam. So if you want to go and figure it out, you know, if, you, if anybody wants to try to use it, I mean, I'm willing to help. But like I said, I don't, I don't use it anymore. It's, it's, it's... Can you do the same thing in VCARP? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, why don't you use it anymore? Too complicated for what I want to do. I can go in there in, in CAD and do it faster than figuring out how to set it up and running it. Plus, uh, is that is, true? Do you, do you do very many, uh, have you done very many dovetails in CAD? Uh, very few. I did them on. I can see where the, the mortise and tendons and the variations on that that you did, even the curvy, the cavy wavy or whatever you called it. Um, those are very cool. But if you're wanting to do traditional dovetails, that tool yeah. looks like it'd be pretty useful. Let's see. See if I can figure, find one or a picture. Maybe I didn't even. Uh, I don't. No, I don't have. I actually did uh, one design with it. I did it manually. Yeah. So, you want me to talk about that really quick? We have. Do we have time? We're almost out of time. What do you want to do? I can. I can talk about that real quick if you want. Uh, go ahead. If, 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 does anybody have any objections? I don't have any objections before we leave. I'd like to understand if there's a way that someone can get in touch with Terry because, you know, we don't make those things public and I'd like to actually give them a call afterwards sometime in the week and just talk. Probably one of the better ways and Perry, you can correct me if, if you have a better idea, but if you go into the, um, the forum .sdfdwa.org and go to the CNC, uh, special interest group, you can, um, do a search for Perry and you'll see PWC cycles and you can um, message him and then he can send you his contact information privately. Yeah, that's a good idea. Or you can just you know, ask the question. If it's just a question, ask it on the forum and that way everybody can benefit from, uh, from the answer. And is this recording of this session going to be posted somewhere? Yes, it will. Where would that be at? Uh, same place on the forum. Okay, forum.sdfdwa.org uh, under CNC. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It may take me a couple of days to get it converted and posted, but it'll be out there. Okay, I haven't used this for a while, so excuse me if I if I uh, if I forget some things. But let's just talk about the simple <clears throat> simple dovetail. So. <clears throat> I think there's a version of this. I think Travis bought a version of this for the Shape Oco in the shop. Is anybody else? Pretty sure he did, because I remember using it, because I bought a copy too. Uh, actually, the guy that designed it is really nice. He actually he made a feature for me that uh, I asked for, so he's really cool. What you do to use this tool is you go in and you parametrically define what you want your dovetail to look like. So the whole key to using this is taking his instruction book and for every parameter he's talking about, go and read about what he's really what he's really asking. Uh, in this case, width of stock, well, that's easy. This is going to be a five inch wide board. Uh, thickness, three quarters of an inch, that's easy. How high do you want the tail? So I want the tails to go through the entire width of the material. Uh, I want it to be three quarters of an inch wide. Same with the pins. Pin tail extension, I don't remember what that is. So excuse me. Anyway, uh, pins equals tails equals tools. So basically you want them to be equivalent as far as the, the size of them. Uh, use a roughing tool. Absolutely, you want to use a roughing tool. Use a roughing tool basically is selecting a quarter inch or whatever end mill to do the clearance that we talked about before. Uh, roughing allowance, how much do I leave uh, on the sides? Uh, that's either the sides or the bottom. Hang on one second. Maybe I should explain that. Oh. Wow, I actually defined all this. I must have been, I must have had a lot of energy when I wrote this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if, if I'm giving you this, this presentation, then I, you can actually look it up here. I'm uh, riffing it out. It's a monetary left after riffing passes. I hate reading off slides, but in this one case, I'll do it. Uh, But I can't remember. I can't remember if this is in the vertical direction or the. 
It looks like it's both vertical and uh, yeah, right. I think it's right. Yeah, I think it's both. No, no, it must be. It must be the vertical book. It must be the the on each side because here's the rock roofing depth allowance. Yeah. So if you want to leave extra material on the bottom, so you're for whatever reason, uh, that I don't really know if that helped you with the tear out or not. Probably not. Oh, here we go. If I only made a diagram, roughly, <laughs> that's funny. Roughing allowance, you can see where that is. Well, I answer asked my own question. And depth allowance here, <clears throat> and then here's the straight bit. Well, this is a good, that's a good, uh, a good uh, thing. All right, let's go back. Uh, what else? It seems to me if you're going to be doing a lot of dovetails with uh, different sizes of uh, material, that this would be, this tool would be worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, well, I will agree with that. <clears throat> uh, one of the best parts about this tool is it lets you calculate and it lets you preview what you're trying to create down here. That's great. Uh, it also lets you specify and you, you can define a library of dovetail bits and then you can also define a library of regular bits. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm At this point, yeah, we'll about... take a moment and open it up to questions, and uh, we'll do we'll take a few questions, and then I'll stop the recording, and then we can visit for a little bit if people want to, but we'll uh, uh, won't be prolonging the recording too much longer. Any questions for Perry? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Oh, one quick question: Is this? Um this these slides that perry has created and has been showing us are those available somewhere i think travis has posted it if not uh I, you know i i i wrote the class to donate to the shop so or the, the association so i have no problem putting it wherever okay well when i post the video perry maybe you can attach it there there you go thank you that'd be great and I tried to make this is when, when I create these slides, I try to make them as much of a reference manual as possible without going too nuts. So you can see I tried to describe every parameter. So hopefully it will be useful to you in that uh, respect. Looks great. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Perry, I would like to thank you for taking the time this morning. I was very happy when I received your response that you'd be able to share this with us because this is um, much, much better than the speculation I was I, I would have been able to present myself. So I was very uh, happy to have your exper expertise. And uh, over the next several months, I hope to be doing uh, some more joinery this way. And um, I'll report back to the group how that goes. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording right now.